one I've got is from uh, Iru, and he wanted to know how to avoid non-trending markets. How to avoid non-trending markets? Look at the chart. Yeah. If you're not too sure, find someone who's got a young child. Or you need to kick at. Yeah. Take a look and say, look at this chart. Is it going up or down or sideways? And the kid who has absolutely no preconceptions and no money involved apart from the KitKat will say, no, it's, going, it's not doing anything, it's going sideways. Yeah. Or it's going up or it's going down. Give him the KitKat, you just save millions of dollars. So really what's happening in a, in a non-trending market, if you cannot see a clear trend, if you can't see a clear trend, look at the chart, it's not going up or down, okay, it's not trending. Yeah. That's all you need to know. And there are some charts that are too messy, too erratic to be able to trade. Yeah. I was looking at and doing a, a training class in, uh, in Singapore a couple of weeks ago for brokers and dealers. And they were saying, what about DBS, which is a major a Singapore development bank, a major bank? What do you do, man? Yeah. It's a good blue chip stock, but it's untradeable because you cannot apply any analysis method that will give you clear, consistent entry and exit points or a stop loss management method. Mm. So from my perspective, it's a stock I, don't, I wouldn't be involved in because once I'm in it, there's no method that I can have that will reliably tell me this is the time to get out or this is the time to stay in. Yep. And there's lots of messy stocks like that in the market. Key factor, you have 1,000, 1,800 stocks to choose from. You only have to trade one or two. So find the one that's most attractive yeah. and trade it. Excellent, excellent. And I've got a, a, a final question here from uh, Joe uh, Nemec, and he wanted to know, uh, what formula slash system is most accurate in predicting a stock's next day price range? What's the holy grail, Daryl? <laughs> None that I've been able to find. So, in predicting the next price range or the next stock activity, there are a couple of, uh, of chart patterns that will give you a high level of probability. Um, but there's nothing there that's reliable and it's consistent. You've got to decide in the market whether you're a gold digger or whether you're a pirate. Mm. What a gold digger does is look for uncovered gems out there. All I've got to do is find them. And if I find them before someone else, they're mine. Yeah, yeah. Okay? I spend a lot of time chasing gold, physical gold. And believe me, there's an awful lot of dirt between the gold. Yeah. A lot of time, a lot of effort. And yes, you get some good rewards, but hey, it's, it's hard work. And that's the same in the market. And there is this belief that goes back to the 1930s that if we have information before someone else, we can make a fortune. It's called inside trading, but when we do it, it's okay. It's just called down. Or skill or whatever. That's our thinking. So if we can develop an indicator that will tell us when the market's going to move more quickly. Look at the amount of hours that have been spent taking a moving average combination, let's say 10 and 30, and trying to adjust it so that yeah. the crossover signal is moved back in time so that it's equal or coincides with the actual change in trend, or better still, a yeah. bit further back so it gives us early warning. What's the result of 50 years of computer analysis? The result is zero. Yeah, it's when, not there. When you apply it to real yeah. time, you it find... It doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't work. So that's the gold digger. Oh, I'm trying to find something no one else knows about. Don't tell anyone. It's, it's my claim. I'm a pirate. The largest resources of gold were discovered by the Spanish in South America. Mm. And, you know, you can go and watch all sorts of wonderful films about all the deprivations that people took on to get hold of this gold. But what they eventually did is they put it onto ships. And there's an annual treasure freight that sailed from South America via the Philippines back to Europe. You're going after that ship, aren't you? We're going after the ship. In other words, I want other people to find the gold for me, put it all together, then I'll join them. And that's what we're trying to do. Not just in trying to find the gold. We're pirates, not gold yeah. diggers. Well, hearing some of these sort of questions and some of the questions I'm sure you get all the time um, and all that you've learnt over the years, like you're an avid reader and studier of the markets. Um, looking back now, it's that age-old question, you know, if I'd have known what I know now... Um, I it, still make just as many mistakes and that's one of the key factors. That's the difference between training and other sorts of things. If I go and sit in an examination, uh, then once I pass the exam, that's it. Yeah. I don't have to reset. In the market, we get an exam every day. And it has absolutely no relationship to what we did yesterday or the day before. So our success is always conditional upon the success of our next trade or the next trade or the next trade. There is never any mastery of the market. It doesn't mm. exist. What happens is you have to constantly adjust, modify, change. Because yeah. markets change and you also change. Yeah. You're not the same at 50 as you were at 30 as you were at 20. Some of it's the fact you've got more money. Some of it's the fact you've got more experience. Some of the fact 
that you've been through a variety of different experiences, so your reactions become different. Perhaps your reaction becomes slower, not as fast on the mouse as you used to be. All these come into, into play. So you as a trader undergo development. Mm. Your needs change. Uh, so what you saw as an attractive opportunity in 20 years ago is not the same as it is 10 years ago, it's not the same as it is now. Then the markets change. Yeah. The behaviour of the markets, the volatility of the markets, trending continuity, all of that changes. And then the instruments change. When the instruments change, the methods you can use to trade, then that changes flows in money in the market. So money that used to be in some sectors of the market is no longer there. For instance, what defines blue chips these days? Go back 10 or 15 years, blue chips were those stocks that were held by investors, mm -hmm. by rich people. Now they're held by funds and fund managers. Yeah, yeah. They've got different characteristics to individuals. What's the relationship in the speculative market? What's left in the spec market? What happens when we talk about dark pools working in the market? What impact does that have? What happens when we talk about multiple exchanges, when GX comes and works alongside ASX? Where's the institutional money go? It goes to GX, doesn't go to ASX. When it goes to GX, when does that trade get reported back to the underlying market? How can we find the best price discovery? Do we end up in a situation like we have in the US where you can trade five or six different trading platforms, different markets, and where you can't get the best execution price because they're not all electronically linked? Yeah. All these factors change the nature and the character of market behaviours, and we've got to adjust all the time. Yeah, I suppose it has to make you incredibly humble as a trader, because you'll uh, constantly have to learn when you find out, oh, I haven't oh, yeah. this right, and continue to evolve. The, the final question I usually like to finish up on the interviews, because especially with you, having studied so much and continue to study, you really do have your finger on the pulse, um, what are some of the sort of people you, um, you know, keep an eye on, you know, as they're developing um, their material and also, you know, where are your news sources that you're helping to develop, you know, the insights you're getting? We get this, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate. I do a lot of work on CNBC, so they're bringing in um, the top traders, investors, fund managers all the time as guests. So I'm talking with them both on air and off air about various odds and ends, so that helps broaden the perspective to some extent. I'm looking at the material that's being written, I'm working with individual traders, that's part of the reason I like doing seminars and workshops, because students are giving me feedback, giving me ideas, and by forcing me to explain my thinking, that helps me to improve my thinking. The market is, again, not about secrecy, it's not about gold mines, it's about pipes, yeah. it's about sharing. There's a book by Alvin Toffler called Power Shift, not one of his most popular books. In fact, the second half of it is really not particularly useful, the first half is okay, but there is one sentence which he writes, which is the most important, which says that everyone can use the same information at the same time and make money. Yeah. And that's the key underlying difference in the market. None of us have an advantage. We all get the same information at the same time and 90% of us get it wrong. Mm. You get the same end of day information, you cannot act until the market opens tomorrow morning. We're all using the same tools, we're all using the same charting techniques, we're all using the same analysis methods, yeah. but reaching different conclusions. So why are we reaching different conclusions? It's not related to the tools, not related to the market, it's related back to ourselves, the way we see what's happening. So if we can improve the way we're seeing, and we do that by talking, by understanding what other people are doing, then we can improve the results. Excellent. Um, I think you provided so many tremendous insights along the way, and I know you talked about just you know one sentence in that book. I feel like if someone was to watch this interview a few times, they'd find many fantastic sentences there. So really appreciate your your time. If people want to find out more about you, they can go to guppytraders.com. That's a, a, a fantastic way to see what you're up to. Is there any other ways they can get in touch with you? Usually just go through support. Um, I tend to travel a little bit, so yeah. you know, I try to keep on top of my emails. It's not always as successful as I would like, but we always answer all our emails within 24 hours. Fantastic. So anything that comes through that staff can't answer, then it will come through to me, and then uh, I will answer. But of course, you know, there's a range of, of, of DVDs and books and so on, and you're handling some of those, so Fantastic. you may find them useful. All right, guys. Well, I, uh, I know you've really enjoyed that interview. Um, I'm going to try and uh, see if I can talk Daryl into organising a special deal for you guys. So stay tuned and I'll, I'll be in contact with that. But uh, thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed it.